Bibles to the book of Psalms, chapter number 66. The young people are dismissed to children's church this morning. Psalms, chapter number 66. Praise God. Amen. Just keep your finger there. We're going to read, but I want to share a little bit with you for a moment before I get there. I want to tell you a story about a little girl named Frances. Frances' story is pretty amazing. True story. Frances was 46 days old. And, I'm sorry, 42 days old. And, uh, she caught a cold. Infection started setting in her eyes, and her eyes became inflamed. And so the doctor prescribed mustard poultice, which is like a type of uh, uh, crushing and putting a paste on the eye. And instead of it making her eyes any better, this desperate remedy actually resulted in her blindness. Can you imagine 42 days of sight in her life? We don't remember things when we were six weeks old. So Francis didn't even remember being able to see. And, uh, uh, but it was followed by 95 years of blindness. Six weeks of sight, but 95 years of blindness. And Francis, uh, she did this. She filled her time with a rhyme. She filled her time with a rhyme. And uh, she first published her first uh, a poem, her first rhyme at the age of eight years old. And she said this, Oh, what a happy soul I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world, contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep inside because I'm blind. I simply cannot. I won't. And uh, Francis uh, taught us in her life that with God's help, that afflictions really become assets in our life. And uh, that trouble is an imposter because it is really a, 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 a miracle in disguise that trials are veiled behind mercy. And uh, uh, she simply would say later, if perfect sight were offered to me tomorrow, I would not accept it. I might not have sung the hymns to praise the, the, the God I have been distracted by. If I, the, the songs, I, songs I sing to God, I may have been distracted by the beautiful and interesting things about me. She went to the New York Institute for the Blind, and there uh, she learned to father express her poems, and she put them into songs, and, and the lyrics came. And at the age of 44, she had wrote many, many uh, secular songs, but at the age of 44, she decided that she was going to solely give her life to writing hymns, and she write, wrote over 8,000 hymns. You know who she is. Her name is Fanny Crosby. What an amazing lady. She would go down in history as the most prolific hymn writer in American history. She wrote the songs, Draw Me Nearer to the Cross, Safe in the Arms of Jesus, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Perhaps one of her most noted songs that she wrote came when she went to visit one of her friends, Phoebe Palmer Knapp. And when she went to visit her, Phoebe had played the piano and had come up with this melody. And she said, Franny, she said, could you give me words to place to this melody that I had written? And so she played the melody. Uh, uh, she said, give me the, some lyrics for it. And, and the song has lasted for over five generations. The song is this. Blessed assurance, Jesus is Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. 
heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of the Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my song. And that's what I want to look at this morning. This is my story. And this is my song. I feel the whole ghost here. Brother Eli, you said it well this morning. All of us have made mistakes. All of us. That is our story. But I'm more concerned about what is our song today. This is my story. This is my song. In Psalm 66, verse number 16, the Word of God says, Come here, all ye who fear the Lord. And I will declare what He has done for my soul. Come here, come and hear all ye who fear the Lord. And I will declare what He has done for my soul. If you read much about David, you will read of David's mentions. There are six of them. Mention simply means this. It means when you take and you engrave something upon gold, it becomes a mention. And David really did when he wrote the Psalms, he engraved it upon gold, something that will not tarnish, something that is valuable, something that will last. Amen. This is my story. This is my song. David wrote it upon his mention. He engraved it in gold, something that will last. Can I tell you as believers this morning, each of us have a mention. It is our story that is engraved upon gold. It will not tarnish and it will not, uh, uh, it will not fade away. It has great value when we allow God to write our story and we sing the song. One person said this, uh, 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 each, every age needs a sage. What is a sage? Something that is savory, something that delivers. And every, uh, every uh, sage, it needs a saga. That state, sage is that reflective experience. And every story a song. So we have a stage, a stage where we have a reflective experience. Amen. It turns into a, a, a saga, which is ours. Our saga is a story. And then it becomes a song. Amen. And so David is saying this. He said, I want to give you something that is engraved in gold. This is my story, but yet it is my song. Amen. I'm talking talking about Thanksgiving this morning, amen, that God gives every one of us a story. And through His grace and through His mercy, He changes our story into a song. Every one of us. I believe this. Yeah, within this gold, it is reflective of worship. No wonder that in Solomon's temple, there was gold everywhere as they worshiped God because it was engraved a worship. Do you realize that your life is a story this morning? But your life is also a song. And a song is indicative of worship. So everything about you that God is writing in your life, God is transforming your story into a song that brings worship and praise to Him. Think about it. David's writing it. Here is this young boy. We encounter him first as a shepherd boy. The job that no one else wanted to do. The forgotten one. That when, that, that when Samson, uh, Samuel comes by to anoint, he's forgotten about, but God's not forgotten about him. He's playing the harp. He's slaying the lion and the bear. He's taking care of the sheep. No one else sees him, but he's faithful. He's loving. He's gentle. He's providing. And so it becomes part of his saga. It becomes part of who he is. 
becomes part of this song. Here is this man that's anointed to be king. He's treated unjustly by, by, by the king who is. And uh, he flees for his life. He's a faithful friend to Jonathan. And we find that, that he conquers a giant. But we find that he can't conquer his own lust. And so he falls in love with another man's wife. He lusts after her. He conceives a child with her. He commits murder in the act of all this. And then when his child is born, he he watches that child die. How terrible. I mean, can you imagine watching your own flesh and blood die before your eyes? You're dealing with your own sin. You've murdered someone. You've tried to do right. It's a mix of all kinds of things. It truly is the spice of life. But one thing that we recognize about David is this, is that he pauses the song of the sage of his life uh, becomes a story and then it becomes a song as he sings praise to God. In many of the songs he starts out with conflict and what's going on in his life and by the end of it he is giving worship to God. All of us have a story. Some of them have conflicts within them but the end result should be a song that brings worship to our God. A song that is like an inscription in gold. It will not tarnish. It is something that is valuable and will endure. Your song will endure through countless ages this morning. If you allow God to write the song. How amazing. Sometimes we need to be like Fanny Crosby and our eyes be blinded to the things of this world so that we can focus on and not be distracted from the God who loves and cares so much for us. Amen. Song of Solomon says this, Thy name is an ointment poured forth. Amen. We look in heaven and we find that, and I preached on this uh, a couple of months ago, that here there are around about the throne of heaven, those saints that are waving palm branches. We said in this life, we have palm branches indicative of victory. And in the other hand, we have the willows, which are indicative of difficult things in our life. But the end result, even though we held a willow in our hand in this life, in the end in eternity, we will hold a palm of all the victories that God has given to us. And that will be our song throughout the endless age around the throne of grace. It will be a beautiful uh, uh, smelling ointment to God. Amen. As God allows us to sing our hallelujahs before the th throne of grace. It is our song. It's amazing to me how songs are. And I've told you this before. But there's often times when I, as, in my role as a chaplain, will walk into a room where there are uh, patients that, 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 that are just, their, their mind has been affected by the terrible disease of Alzheimer's. And I'll go in and they won't know who they are. They won't know who their children are. They won't know what day it is, who the president is. They won't know all kinds of information that is relevant to today. I'll begin to talk to them and their eyes will look glassy. And so immediately I go to what I know is important. I'll go to the Word of God that I know that they've memorized. Or quite often I'll go to an old hymn and all of a sudden we'll be quoting Amazing Grace or the old rugged cross. And Brother David verbatim, they can say to me the words of that song. I'm telling you there's something about song when God places it in us that when everything else is God, the song will stand. Can I tell you that God wants to change your life story into more than just being a story, but He wants it to be a song that you can sing through the endless age. Amen. To God be the glory as we sing songs of praise to Him. I think it's interesting that when we look at songs, most often they're indicative of redemption and what Christ 
has done for us. When we look even at David's song, he talks about redemption throughout the Word of God. It's reflecting forward to the cross. So could I tell you that our song of each of our lives need to be indicative of the cross because that's what makes our story a great song. Now as you look at that cross, it's so important. Get this in your mind this morning. It's a very simple picture. In fact, I remember as a child, one of the first things okay, I ever did as a child, I remember singing in church and drawing the cross. It's just two lines. There's one horizontal and there's one vertical. It's simple. So when I think about our song, and when our song is changed from a story into a song, it happens when the cross takes place in our life. A moment of realizing that God is writing our story. And Brother Eli, you said that every one of us have things that when you look back at your life, you cry to think that was stupid. But the blood of Jesus washes that Amen. and cleanses it. And washes away all of our guilt and all of our stain. The cross changes our story into a song. If it was simply a story, Brother Eli, we would be so uh, uh, ridden by that story that this is a terrible, this is, this is the narrative of my life. This is what I'm indicative of. I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a murderer. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fornicator. I'm an adulterer. All those things because even if we do them in our minds, we're held guilty of them. So that would be our story. But the cross comes in the picture. And our story has changed. And now all of a sudden, there is this melody that is added to the story of our life. And the cross changes our life because the plan of redemption and, and the methodology of grace in our life, amen, as it takes place in salvation, it changes our story so immensely. And so David said this. He said, come and hear all you that fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. He says this. He said, man, I was a guy who was on the Backs out of the desert forgotten. I was a guy who was, it was, it was fleeing from my life and hiding out in a cave. And I was a guy who committed sin. And I was a guy who murdered somebody. I'm a guy who felt sorrow come over me as I watched my own child die before my eyes. And I've seen terrible things happen within my children. But come now, let me tell you, my story has changed because the grace of God has changed me. It's not just a story, but oh, there's a melody to it. And a song that's inscribed upon gold. It will last forever. It will not tarnish. It will last for the endless age. And so here it is. That David shares his song. If you look throughout the Psalms, you will find names of people. And, 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 and quite frankly... They are the figures of, 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 of the tabernacle. They're the figures of the temple. They're the figures of, uh, uh, of the New Testament church. Asaph, which means God gathers. Uh, Heman, which means God is faithful. And, and Jutham, which means God is worthy of praise. I need to tell you this. We sing this morning our song because of His greatness. Our God is great. And our God is greatly to be praised. We sing of his beauty because of the ten thousands. He's altogether the lovely one, Brother David. We sing of his mercies because they're everlasting in his compassions. They fail not. Amen. I, I, I tell you that, that we begin to magnify the Lord in our song. And he gets big because every one of us in here has a story. And we have a song. And I really feel like if we're approaching this month of thankfulness. The greatest thing that we can be thankful for is the song that He gives us. Everything about our song is vertical. My story is about Him and how He's wrote my life. I mean, you think about the word history. It is His story. It's His story. It's his story written in the United States of America, but it's his story written in Sister Susan. It's his story written in Brother David and in Sister Tina. It's his story written in Sister Tiffany. It's his 
his story and then he changes the story into a song like Fanny Crosby said I, 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 I don't want to be distracted uh, but, 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 but it started out as a rhyme and the rhyme turned into something else all of a sudden it turned into music and now I sing about my God and how great he is you may think that your life is a rhyme but it's more than a rhyme it's a song amen of the story that God has written in you It's interesting if you've ever heard of the book of Endurance written by Ernest Shackleton. And he tells the story about 28 men crossing the Antarctica. It took them two years to do it, and it was a terrible journey. And in his adventure, he tells about how they were allowed to bring two pounds with them, and they brought uh, gold. But they, uh, in the story, one important thing was important. Besides bringing the two pounds on the ship, these 28 men, and their two-year journey across the Antarctica, there was one thing that was necessary to bring, even though other people thought it was frivolous, they brought a banjo. And the banjo player would sit and play. And the captain of the ship thought it was so important to have the banjo because it drove away depression. Can I tell you that every age needs a sage and every sage needs a song and every story needs a song. It's important that we particularly as believers and as Pentecostals, we do not throw our song away because our song is important important when we begin to sing the song of our life and what redemption and mercy has done for us. It'll drive away depression and discouragement. It'll drive away fear and anxiety. And as the journey is long and longer than we expected, at times, amen, God is faithful and our song will give us strength and encouragement. It's interesting when we look at the Old Testament and the New Testament when they were teaching, and they even say that the apostles' doctrine was turned into this. But can you imagine we live in a day and hour where there is illiteracy. illiteracy. But back in those days, there were many who was illiterate. And so by the day before them to look at the Word of God, they could not look at it, and they could not uh, 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 read it. And so what they would do is they would, they would begin to make it into song. All the things of the Word of God. And then as they sung that, it would come to their memory, the Word of God, the things of God. Some of you, maybe even now, you remember back in the day before you were saved, you hear a little tune and that, those words bounce right in your head. Why is that? Because our mind is developed to work that way. That we think about song, and we think about tunes, and we think about lyrics. I, I, my, my wife is, and I appreciate this, in the little Sunday school class, teaching them the books of the Bible by song. You know what? Because one day they're going to be scrolling through their Bible and they're going to sing that song and know where all the books of the Bible are. We sing it so that we can learn more about God. Amen. We need to be singing about the things of God and who God is and what He has done in our life. Our story must be our story. But God's song must become our song. When our story becomes changed to God's song, come here, all you that fear the Lord, David said, and I will share with you the greatness of God. So we look at the cross, that upward plank of the cross that's to God. But then we have the vertical and the horizontal. It becomes now not only our story with God, but now we've got to share with others what God has done for us. It's just who we are. It's just how it happens. If they're convicted or if they're offended. But I think we have allowed our song to be stolen for way too long. We know our story. We know what God has done for us, but we don't sing the song. We need to sing the song of what God has done for us. I lost myself in my notes, but it's interesting that the Ameri American College of Medicine some years ago determined that in stroke victims, they did not have the ability to articulate verbally 
what they wanted to say. But if they asked them to sing, they could do it. Because they found that in one side of the brain, it works for the talking, but in another part of the brain, it works for singing. How amazing is that? It's one thing to talk your story, but it's another thing to sing your story. Amen. You may be handicapped on some levels with articulation, but your life should be singing your love song to God and what He has done for you. I believe that we need to elevate Christ appropriately. And when we sing the song of what He's done in our life, amen, we elevate Him. Whenever Moses and Joshua came down off the mountain, and Joshua, he encountered the worship of the golden calf. Joshua thought there was war. But uh, Moffat translates it this way, that Moses said, I hear the sound of many people singing courses. Do you know what was happening? They were singing to the God that they made. Amen. It's time that we, the people of God, amen, begin to sing to the God who changed us. Amen. And people far away hear the anthem that we sing that God got into my life. Some of you in here, maybe they would say, I know that old guy. He was a rotten scoundrel. I remember his attitude and his anger. I remember how he drank or how he smoked or how he cut like a sailor. I remember how she acted. Amen. That's not the anthem anymore. Christ got involved in this story. Amen. And changed me. Amen. And he gave me his song. This story got his song. And now I sing it to everyone. And they're going to know what Christ has done for me. Amen. Amen. I'm talking about singing our story. Singing our story. This is interesting. I'm closing so Sister Holly can get ready to come to the camp. You all know that fellow in the Bible by the name of Judas? You know that guy that you would never name your children after? Don't even name your daughter after. Unless you didn't like him. <laughs> Judas comes from the war blue praise. We know what that or, or Judah. Judas comes from Judah, which is indicative of praise. Sorry, my mind's working quicker than my mouth is working. So here is Judas. It should have been praise, but he becomes the God who kisses the door to heaven and goes straight to heaven. I'll say. We know his story is this that he was the guy who was in charge of the money. And the money box, the Greek word typically used for it is batalia. Now I know that doesn't mean anything to you. And and I am not a Greek scholar. I simply read this as I was studying. However, instead of it being a talia, which should be used for money box, the word that is used here is glossia kind. That word actually is indicative of a box that was used to place reeds in from music instruments. You follow me? So here is Judas. He says, my music and my story. And God writing it and God giving glory. The reeds aren't important. But what's important is giving it money. If we're not careful in our life, we can become so off balance by what's important. Judas, you should have kept the reeds. You should have kept your song. Your story transferred into a song by God. But instead, the money was more important. 
what are the things in our lives that can become more important than being the keeper of the real box? What are the things that steal our song and our music that we no longer sing a song of worship and praise to God about what is written in our life? Everybody in here, we're different. We can be a little different economically. We can be a little different socially. We can be a little different academically. But it doesn't matter when it comes to our song. Because we all have one thing that's important. Is allowing the cross to meet our story and change our story into a song. It first starts with us and God. That our story all of a sudden has this wonderful, wonderful blending with God's song. God does that. And then, Brother David, we have to share it with others because the cross is at the store of our cross. The, 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 the cross is at the center of our story and our song. Fanny Cross, we started out with a rhyme until one day God changed her rhyme into a story. And it continues to go on. Terry, your story is different than my story. Brother Josh, my story is different than your story. Sister Susan, your story is different than Brother Josh's. Sister Jenny, yours is different than Sister Susan. Everybody has their own story. That's the beauty. Sister Tina, it's written in gold. It is valuable. It will not tarnish throughout the endless age. Your story must be a song. And one day around the throne of grace, we will sing a new song because God gave us each a song to sing. Could I ask you this Thanksgiving season, could you just echo your song to everybody you meet so that they may hear what God has done for you? This morning, Let's get around and say, God, I'm owning my story and I'm owning my soul. I'm singing it to you, but I'm proclaiming it to all. Let's get around this morning. Each of you have a beautiful story and it's been transform transformed by the mercies of God. And now it's a song. Thank God for the melody that He passes to our story. Sing it. Sing it out this morning.